belong. I belong. I belong. I belong. I belong. I belong. I belong. My name is Hunter Bankston. And I currently help out with the children's ministry and welcoming the kids, and I get to greet them every day and go over our five pillars. I came to Life Change Church because I felt spent a couple years not knowing where I belong, um, just really struggling on where God wanted to lead me. And ever since then, I felt like I belonged and had a place to serve God's kingdom. I belong because I feel like this is where I can connect the most in my church family. And I feel like my abilities that God gifted me with work the best back here. I was in a place where I was lost and alone, and God put it on my heart to cry out to him and ask him, are you real? And he showed up, he changed my life forever, and he brought me to a place where I know that I'm alone. I love that my children get to be a part of this church, also to be an example to follow for future generations. So I feel like I belong at Life Change Church because of the welcoming environment that the people have here and that the pastor and the church family has, but even more than that, uh, since the first time coming here, it's truly been because of the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. I belong. Good afternoon now. It's just a couple minutes after 12, and I want to uh, share with you that this week uh, I was prepared to give a completely different message, and it was on storm chasers. And the Lord had been prompting my life and prompting in my heart about how we have learned to be storm chasers, and even COVID just stirred up that whole space in our life even more so. But that's not what the message was or is going to be today. What it's going to be on is uh, raising kids and literally uh, trying to give us some understanding. And when I share this with you, you're going to hear about a lot of fallacies in the space of my life because I have a lot of those to offer. I, I already shared, I go, if there's one area in my life where I feel like I've, I've failed the most is in parenting. And uh, an area where uh, I have struggled and an area where I want to do it right, the cost is so high. You know, if you think about it, you, you can't take anything in this world with you. But you know one thing you have that gives life eternally is a child. A child is the most important. I mean, they live somewhere forever. It's, um, it's so important that we um, lead our children. So in Psalms 127, I have a scripture, and then I'm going to share with you kind of how the Lord this week... Uh, and I call it, I use the word arrested because sometimes I'm in the space of my busy schedule or I'm just doing life the way I normally do it or maybe not even normally do it and I just get stopped in my tracks and the Lord speaks to me in an area. I call that being arrested and kind of like if I've ever been pulled over and yes, I have been pulled over uh, by police officers. Um, and not recently, it's been good, but... <laughs> I have been, and uh, I never pull that, that little pastor card out. Don't do it. Um, in fact, I, you know, when it has happened in my life, um, I just go, well, if I got, I usually, if I see the lights, I just go right over, and uh, I'll never forget with somebody in our church um, that was an officer, and he didn't know I had a motorcycle at the time. I don't have one now, but I was getting pulled over on the motorcycle, and uh, he comes back, and and he gave me that look. Pastor Ron, you know better. And uh, I gave him that look of, you know what, I do. I do know better. So point is, um, a lot of times we know better. A lot of times we just get, whatever, we just get in. Life just has a way of driving us and not being led by the Spirit. The Bible says those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Those who receive, they, God gives them the power to be a child of God. And so I, my struggle is, am I listening to what the Holy Spirit's saying? And am I in a place of receiving to do that very thing? 
Psalms 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the building, builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. It's useless for you to do work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. The children are a gift from God. They're a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. And then even God tells us why he puts two people, a married couple, together. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 15 says this, Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and in spirit, you're his. And what does God want out of that relationship? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. So this week, and I kind of alluded to it already, um, I, had, and I had a word many years ago that was spoken over me. It says, the things that you go through, the trials that you go through in your life will be messages for God's kids, church family. So uh, what a word that that has turned out to be where things that are messy. So I'm going to share a messy one for you right now. And that was um, this Wednesday, um, I had a meeting with, in fact, he just spoke. His name is Hunter, and he just dedicated his child this morning in first service. And, and Hunter is wanting to be in the full-time ministry. And so I'm discipling him. I'm spending time once a month with him. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm sharing with him when I was a children's pastor and, and time when, you know, that as a, as what God had done through my life and, and the things that were faith and, and building. And I had visions. And I, I, I remember being in, I told him, I said, a time I was at a, a camp and I'm sitting in this dock and, and the Spirit of God just shows me his presence. And, and I, I just, I was just caught up in it. And then I, I shared with him some other times where we had kids camp and just some, things that because he's wanting to be involved with kids and so that was Wednesday and then on Thursday morning I feel con convicted about doing this with my son now I have seven kids all of them uh, are adults and and uh, been in marriage and and uh, and the last one is no children yet but been married for a year and and so uh, the the young man that I'm talking about his name is Austin and and a great young man, and I thought, I'm going to share with him, you know, the things of God in my life. And I stumbled over my words. I tripped up. I mean, I had practice Wednesday. I practiced Wednesday. And, you know, my speech class, I was Wednesday practice, and I did a run through, and it went great. And so now on Thursday, I'm in front of my kid, and I'm stumbling over my words, tripping over. I feel like a, a failure, and feel like I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I don't know what to say, and I'm not saying enough. I'm not saying, I'm saying too much, and I, I share that with you because I know I'm not alone, that when you struggle the most, talking about God with your spouse, or talking about God with your kids, that's where, you know, and, and the Lord really prompted me, because how in the world are we going to train our kids or train our marriage or our relationship if we struggle so much talking about God in it. And how, are the, how is the next generation, you know, and, and if you're like me, you, you, you want to have your kids see all of your great decision making. <laughs> what a joke. So anyway, you want your kids, and then you want them to come and, and visit you and say, have this appointment with you. Hey, Dad. I am so wowed by you and all your decisions. You're the best dad ever. How do you do it? You're going to wait for that moment. It's not probably going to happen, all right? How many of you realize that most of the time that they, they see your fallacies, they see the things you don't do right and everything, and then that's, of course, that's the thing that you're reminded of so much. And, and I'm going to share with you, if we're going to train our relationships in God, then we're going to have to talk about God. And you're going to struggle with it. In fact, I bet you most of you, if you're being truthful like I'm trying to be right now with you, you struggle with it. And so today when we have communion, we're going to have communion, I pray that you admit it with God. They say, God, that, that's so true. That message is so true. But I want to take a step. 
people are stepping into ch- raising their children today, people are going to take steps in baptism. Father, I want to take a step in talking about you with those I love and you love, my family. I pray that you do that. I pray that not, it's not just your first step, but it's a step of many that you'll take in the future. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says this about discipline. Direct your children onto the right path, and when they're older, they're not going to leave it. Psalms 94, verse 12 says this. Joyful are those you discipline. Lord, those you teach with your instructions. Proverbs 13, 24 says this. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their kids. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. And today people are going, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, are we going to do things the way God wants us to do it? Or are we going to do these things the way we're going to try to figure it out on our own? I, I want to do it the way God wants me to do it. Proverbs 29, 17 says this, Discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. Hebrews talks about God as our father in how we're supposed to raise our kids. Again, I know that this is so contradictory to our culture today. That, we, In fact, the Lord gave me the word. He says that we're, what we're learning is, is tolerance. And, and the word tolerance means that we're, tolerance means that we're just going to allow anything goes. Well, you know, and, and everything goes. But that's not the word of God. That's not how God wants to raise it. In fact, I, I see that. I, I'm going to talk to you about, you know, with my own kid. I've had, I, had, I can give you an example of with my 17-year-old, and I can give you an example with my 3-year-old. Now, remember my 17-year-old, I adopted her, and, and so there were, she, we adopted her at age 13, so there was a lot of things that had happened in her first 13 years, but I can make that all an excuse. I'm not going to. God asked me and anointed me to be a dad or the best I could be. And what happened is, is in, in I struggled in the space of being that dad, and, you know, I, and I, so I leaned into some of my training. I leaned into some of the things where I became insecure. And I'm a, a kind of a, a passive, aggressive type of personality. In fact, I'll talk about one of the things is authoritative or authoritarian. They sound a lot alike, but they're not. And a lot of times when I would get nervous or fearful or things would go wrong, I would become authoritarian. And I'll describe what that looks like. So just kind of remember, you know, I'm going to give you some stories. I did it wrong. And I'm so thankful that God, because I saw God, I knew I was doing it wrong, and I knew that I shouldn't stay in the course of my wrong actions. And I said, God, help me. Help me right in the middle of it. Sometimes I did that. Sometimes I didn't do that. But I'm so grateful that God would always meet me in a space of surrender. Hebrews 12, verse verse 7, As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own kids. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? It goes on a lot today. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his kids, it means that you're illegitimate and are not really his kids at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of our father of our spirits and live forever? So let's just say this. If we don't discipline our children today physically or, or in, their, in the space of their behaviors, how in the world are they going to ever know God discipline? They're not. When, when the Lord brings his discipline, they're out. Because they didn't have any discipline in their home, why would they ever have any discipline in God's home? Verse 10 says, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in His holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there's a peaceful harvest of living right for those who are trained in this way. One more passage, and I'm going to kind of explain the four different types. Genesis chapter 18. Now, Abraham, and if you know a little bit about the Bible, or maybe you don't, but Abraham is called the father of faith. 
It's kind of a, a slogan, a term that God gave to him. And what I love about it is the Bible gives us these little clues of why. And it's found in Genesis chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation. Most of us want to be great and mighty. We want great and mighty things in our life. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have, here's God saying, I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I'll do for Abraham all that I have promised. So I, I want to talk about these four types of personality in, in, in discipline. Four different ways. And I think most of them will make sense to you, but I'll explain it too. Um, so number one in, in your study guide, first of all, we all struggle with this. Okay, parents struggle trying to find an effective way to bring discipline. We struggle, I'll give an example, with a three-year-old and a 17-year-old. Number two, the four parenting styles. The permissive one, the neglectful one, the authoritarian one, and then the one God wants us to be is authoritative. God gives things in his, his word where there's a, the authority isn't you, the, his authority is in his word. It's in his kingdom. When Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So now when you pray that, what you're saying is, God, I want to do it your way to see your results. That's the authority that we're given. His word, he's given us his name. We have the authority of using Jesus' name. There's so much things that God's given us in his kingdom. Number three is your style of parenting either addresses or it will either contribute to the problem. I am so sorry that many times I contributed to my child's problem. And I'm grateful that God has forgiven me. I'm grateful that God has given me an opportunity to get the things right. I'm grateful that his forgiveness is greater than my messiness. Amen? And so hopefully today, um, as we talk about these behaviors, things because these things are learned. Some of these, these things are handed down. Number one, the permissive parent. This is in our culture today. Parenting, they don't, people don't discipline the upper left-hand quadrant represents parents who are high in love but low in discipline. This permissive parent, the study revealed the permissive parents tend to produce kids with very low self-esteem, feelings of inferiority. Though the parents express a lot of love, the lack of boundaries leaves their kids with high level of insecurity. The kids feel loved, but they are feeling so insecure of their limits. Their parents are generally fearful, afraid of messing up, damning their kids' psyche, so they never have any firm found boundaries. The kids feel very loved, but very unsure of themselves. I'm reading this book by John Bevere. It talks about the awe of God. And he says, it's the love of God that leads us in our relationship with God, but it's the fear of God that keeps us from leaving him. It's the discipline that keeps me. You can just be, you can get me led to God, but how many people that have been led by God or even led into relationships leave a relationship? It's these boundaries that keep us in that space. The Bible says the, <laughs> the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I'm not talking about I'm terrified of God. I adore God. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying in the space of being all. I want God's presence in my marriage. I want God's presence in my parenting and my grandparent, the neglectful parent. The lower left quadrant belongs to the worst of all four combinations. The neglectful parents, the kind of parent doesn't express much love and also doesn't even care enough to discipline. Their children tend to grow up with little or no lasting relationships with mom or dad. They're strange because they feel forsaken the parents' neglect may not necessarily be intentional. They may be simply in the midst of their own trauma and chaos. Like an addiction or an abusive situation, they don't purposely desire to neglect their kids, but they don't know how to deal with their own issues adequately and don't have the tools to be healthy parents. These children grow up with unbelievable deep emotional scars, and their only hope is to find Jesus Christ and heal them of their broken hearts and get some Christian counseling in their path. All right, 
Talk about the next one has got a me in it, authoritarian. The authoritarian parent shows up at the lower right-hand quadrant. This kind of parent doesn't express love and affection well, but is very high on discipline. They raise their kids who are, you know, they raise their kids in a, in a strict discipline or wanting the most out of their life. The bar is always high and must always, and there's always this abundant desire for more. This kind of parent isn't content just to win the war. They got to win every battle. Communication between parent and child takes the form of arguing and fighting, especially when the child is old enough to fight back. Authoritarian parents squeeze their kids until the kids can't wait to leave home. And as soon as they do, they rebel. When Paul told the Ephesians not to overcorrect their kids or exasperate them, he was warning authoritarians not to raise their kids so that they would reject the faith altogether. And then the one that God wants us to be authoritative parent. Those who land in the upper right-hand quadrant provide the best combination of love and discipline. This kind of parent is authoritative, not overbearing, but a compassionate yet firm authority. They have clear boundaries, but also are very loving. Everyone knows who the boss is, but they also have the connection between a parent and a child. A consideration that represents and honors the child is while not compromise his or her disciplinary needs. The result is child high in self-esteem and equipped with good coping skills. Now in Matthew chapter 16, there's a passage that Jesus is referring to Peter, his disciple, and talking about, um, in fact, I'll read it to you. It's found in 16 verse 17 to 19. Jesus replied, Simon, you are blessed because my Father in heaven has revealed this truth to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So I'm going to go back to some of my examples. So my daughter, uh, Kendra, at three years old, um, had a toy and was in the living room and at the time our, we had a, in our living room we had an open staircase going down to the basement and she pro, uh, proceeded to and I don't know why but she proceeded to pick up the toy and chuck it downstairs and then I would instruct her in, um, to a three year old as best I could say no, no, that's not what we do and then I'd put the toy back and, and she'd pick up the toy and chuck it downstairs and then we'd have a little bit more contact of love and discipline. And then she looked at me, looked straight at the toy, went right to the toy, picked it up, and chucked it downstairs. And then we had more physical contact. And uh, so, and she was getting more firm in her way. I was getting more firm in my way. I am not going to let a three-year-old win this battle. That ain't happening. You know, and I'm looking at friend and I said, if she's going to win at three, what's she going to do when she's 13? That's how I was getting in this whole thing. And, and so finally, um, I'm realizing we're not winning. God, I'm trying to do this your way. To be honest with you, God, it's not working. I, I had those great words. Like, God, it's not working. I'm crying. She's crying. And we're having this little, you know, space in the living room. And God says, but it also says, deliver them from temptation. I, I mean, I have thought about that scripture before, but never in the context of my three-year-old. And all of a sudden, the Bible says it very clear with Peter. Blessed are you, Baron. Anyway, you guys, not, I don't even want to say it different. Blessed are you, Ron. Anyways, <laughs> but because it's Barjona, it said, you know, he's talking about Peter. Because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. God revealed that to you. So I took the toy I picked it up, put it on top of the refrigerator so that she couldn't see it. And Kendra and Dad had the best moment of love and understanding. We never went through that episode again. She couldn't see past it. And as a dad, I needed to help her. I'm train your child in the way God would have it. Amen? And so the train was there. So now I'm going to give you a 17-year-old moment. So my 17-year-old, again, she had been in my home for now for four years. She had been adopted at three, and she, 
she, she's seen some tough times in foster care. And uh, I was going to raise her, you know, I was going to be the dad that she didn't have, and I was going to, you know, and we, we were just going to, I was going to win this battle, not over her, but so much in her broken heart. And uh, she was having a moment where she was frustrated, and she didn't want to call me dad, and the more she didn't want to call me dad, the more insecure I got. I made it about me. Not that any ever, none of you guys ever do that, right? You never make it about you when you're talking to your kids. But I did. I made it about me, and I had an insecure moment, and then I, I, I yelled at her, and, and uh, I just got very defensive. And when I was all done, um, I, I, I was arrested. I said, God, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? This little girl is hurting, and all I'm doing is hurting her more. That's not what I want to do. It's not what you want me to do. And all of a sudden, again, having one of those spiritual God moments, surrendering, asking God for help, God says, she sees you overbearing. And Lord, what do you want me to do? He says, go to her bedroom, pick her up, put her on her bed, and get down on your knees and talk to her. Posture yourself not over her, but under her, as Jesus is to her. So that she feels like she's being lifted up. And we just wept in that bedroom together. I didn't change my directive. I didn't change or compromise the truths that I was standing for. All I did was change my posture. But I would have never known how to do that if I didn't surrender myself to Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. And so I, I share that with you because, you know what, those are two times I got it right. I probably got 10 times the stories where I didn't. And I, I mean, that's the, that's the truth of it all. The fact is that God loves parenting and that you're gonna struggle. Your kids are gonna try to rebel and I'll share this with you. I discipline rebellion, not creative thinking. I never discipline creative thinking. There, I use that word never. Sorry for using the word never. I try not to discipline creative thinking. Which means if I left crayons to an unattended three-year-old in their bedroom and they colored the walls... That's not rebellion for the most part. That's just creative. And what should be is that what the world were you thinking leaving crayons in a bedroom with a three-year-old? Now, if my 13-year-old did that, that's not creative. we got a whole other problem. Amen? So the point of it is, is that Dr. Dobson did this study and in this study, there was these um, two to three-year-old kids that, you know, um, that were in a daycare. It wasn't even their parents. And in this daycare, they, um, they took down all the boundaries outside. They allowed, they allowed these kids to explore w the distance they could go. And most of the kids, when they took down the fences or the boundaries, wouldn't, because they felt so insecure, they wouldn't hardly leave the door where they left because those kids were looking for boundaries. They, they wanted those boundaries. And you say, well, no, they don't. Yeah, they do. Studies show they need it. Now, what they do with the boundaries, well, there's the fun part about parenting. But they need them. And then they put those boundaries up. Same kids. And they watch these kids begin to walk further into the yard and explore the boundaries. All because they were clear. What I've learned as a, as, a, as a pastor and what I've learned as a parent, what I've learned as, as a husband, as a business leader, is a lot of times I'm just not clear. You know, and the Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2, it says, write the vision down make it clear for those who read it they can run with it though it's for an appointed time 
what better thing for a kid? They're not going to, you know what? Your, your job is to equip them to act like an adult. When my, when my kids leave the home, I want them to handle finances. I want them to handle. You know what I don't want? I don't want my, my daughter-in-law to look at me. You gave me something that I really have to work on. I want them to have a son that knew how to love his wife. Or my, you know what, or my son-in-laws to look at me and go, yeah, you did a great job with the dudes, but man, I don't know what you were thinking with the dudettes. No. I want them to go, Dad, thank you for raising her. I'll take it from here. And I want to be able to have that handoff. And I've had that. I've had that. And I've done so many things inappropriately, ignorantly. But today, I want to share with you as we take communion, I have found a space that God wants me to seek Him, to search out His infinite wisdom. The Bible says, train a child in the, their particular bent. I've realized this. I, was, I wanted to be a professional water skier, so I wanted one of my kids to be a professional water skier. You know how much they don't care about that? None of them. It wasn't their bent. Their bent. But every one of them have their own gifts. And so I'm spending my knee time seeking God. Now they're all adults. I'm still trying to be a good parent. Some of them are like, I, well, I got 40 year olds and I'm still a parent. And my grandkids, I had a bunch of my grandkids over, over this Saturday. They're, you know, they're having the homecoming parade thing and a bunch of them, they're at our house. What better place, inviting them over and they're having dinner at our house. And listen to my son, in law, pray over him. So proud, so proud. Those are those moments. I go, God, I don't deserve this. But you know what God says? That's the blessing of your surrender. It isn't the blessing of your know-how. It's a blessing of your surrender. I don't know how. Even if I knew how to do it, let's say I knew how to do it really good with one. I wouldn't know how to do it really good with the other. But you know what God can do? He can work with that. So parent, grandparent, or maybe you're a foster parent, Maybe you're a single parent. God will work in the space. God says he sanctifies those kids, even with one believing parent. You don't even have to have both believers. Just one believer. One that will surrender. And God will do wonders with it. So today as we take communion, would you take that step? Maybe you go back to your seat. Maybe you go back to this altar, whatever. But I know that Jesus is present here in this worship time. And nothing he wants more is that his son, his daughter, yields for their sons and daughters. Would you please stand up? Father, I ask that you just move in this space of worship. I pray that, Lord, we get entangled with you, Lord. We, there's so much need. I, we have so much need, God. We live in a world, Lord, that's so contrary to you. But God, you're still there. And Lord, all you're looking for is our surrender. So I pray as we take communion today that we surrender and surrender to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said...